So, I know we kind of ended on a heavier note yesterday. I cannot promise you it's going to get any better today. Today is going to be heavier. <laughs> ah! right. But we'll make jokes. Um, so today we want to talk about restoration. And we wanted to give a little bit of an introduction of why when we're talking about sexual wholeness is it so important to talk about restoration. Not everybody in here has, has experienced sexual abuse. Not everyone in here has experienced rape or really any kind of traumatic sexual experience. Not everyone in here has looked at porn. Not everybody has been addicted to porn. Why do we bring this up in a sexual wholeness talk? We hope that reading the Bible, you've gotten the idea that you're supposed to help your brother and sister, right? It's mentioned there a couple times. Uh, in 1 John, he hints you might not be saved if you don't. <laughs> So that's why I don't read that book. Uh, <laughs> really, that book makes me uncomfortable. I love it. More power to you. Uh, so why do we why do we st we stress restoration? Kind of like Linda, which didn't she do a fantastic job yes. today? Yes. Amazing. Please, please tell her if you see her. Don't don't spend ten minutes explaining how her life relates to your life story. But just hey, that was really impactful. That meant a lot to me. That, I don't know if you guys know this, but like when you get up and you talk on that kind of openness level, the devil immediately is going to come in and come after her for the next, not like 10 minutes, but like 10 days. So tell her that that meant a lot, that that was impactful, that's going to build her faith, that's going to help her, just like she did for you guys today, okay? Okay, so why we talk about this in big groups is because like the verse she mentioned today about we confess our sins to one another, we bring our sins out into the light. That takes two, right? <laughs> and you're not always, you know, those of us who have been who have been through this or have experienced trauma don't exactly wear t-shirts that say, I have been sexually abused, feel free to confide in me, right? There's no banner, you can't tell from looking on the outside of us. You're going to have people in your life who have been through these things and they need you to be there for them. I'm not saying you have to be there for the whole journey. Because for some of you, this is like, I don't know how to handle this. I have never experienced this. This freaks me out. I don't know what to do. We have got to become comfortable enough with it and love people enough that we don't shut down when people confide in us with things that might be uncomfortable. Does that make sense? It is so hard when you finally get the guts to talk to someone about these things and, and what you get is, ah! <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. Or, you know, like, what do you, what do you want me to do with that? Um, it's, it, it's hard enough to get the guts out to say these things out loud when you get shocked face or please don't give me details. I'm not saying you have to say, you know, give me every detail. There, but there is a polite way to say, please don't give me any details. Like, hey, I am here for you. I love you. I don't know if I'm necessarily the person to talk to you about this, but I'm willing to help you find someone. <coughs> Doesn't that seem way more loving than, EW, GROSS, GET AWAY FROM ME! Right? <laughs> um, I haven't necessarily gotten that one, but you got this. Can I interject something? No. No, I'm joking. Oh, okay. Well, no. Go cool. Okay. <clears throat> um, I shared some stats with you guys yesterday. I'm going to share some more stats today. But do you guys remember I said that 80% of sexual abuse victims are under what age? 30. Okay? 30, 29. Most of you guys are probably between the age of 19 and 24, right? Okay, that's us, right? What, at what age, so Bethany's talked to counselors, she's interviewed people, she's, she's gone through counseling. What age does the average woman come forth and talk about for the first time? 45. 45. Think about that. 80% are under 30. That's at least 15 years of trying to deal with stuff on their own. Okay, that's... This is not a bunch of people that just like, I, they forgot how to talk, right? There's, there's something there. There's something to that. And 45 is average age. So if that's average, that means there has to be a good chunk that are beyond that. Okay? And a lot of this stuff happens in childhood and teenage years. So you're not even talking it happens at 30. But a lot of it happens younger. So it's very important for us. I've never been through sexual abuse. But I've learned a lot about it. And it is important for us to understand that there is bondage that we don't understand that comes along with it. And it's not something that people who are abused chose. We have got to learn how to be there for them and not be, 
can't handle that. It is ugly. It is rough. It is uncomfortable. <coughs> but if we can't do it, who's going to be there for me? Okay. <laughs> Done. Okay, so the restoration process, why is this so important? Remember yesterday we talked about the reason that you, the reason that it's important that you understand you have a sex life now is because everything you do to your sex life or everything that happens to your sex life today is going to affect your future. I was so grateful for Dr. Bradford's teaching. Is that everything's running together? Was that just last night? I think so. Golly. Yeah. I'm like a new person after that, you know? Um, all of all of the importance that he that that he stated of, of why this is so crucial that we are protecting our bodies, we are protecting our sexuality. You do bring these things into marriage. The tricky thing about sexual abuse, the tricky thing about rape, I don't know any other form of violence where the person who was hurt walks away feeling like they did something wrong. I have yet to meet a person who has been sexually abused that hasn't walked away with a sense of shame and a sense of guilt. I don't understand it. I went through it. <laughs> it's so, you just think, I had to have done something. Couple that with the way that people react to trying to deal with, um, like help someone who has been raped or who has been sexually abused is, why were you there? Why were you wearing that? Why were you with him? Why were you drinking? Blame, 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 blame. Which if it's on its own, you know, if you're, if you're a, a healthy person, you can say, well, I can't, you know, I can't control the actions of another person. But when you've already got that, that root that's been growing, and we're talking, this thing has been growing for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years for some people, maybe even longer. When someone hints that it could be your fault, all it does is solidify in you that, yes, this was my fault. I've been right all along. Um, can someone with a Bible, we're going to look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. I didn't come up with this term, but I really, really wish I had. I heard about it from another amazing, amazing counseling uh, counseling group in Cincinnati called the Innocence Revolution. And what it's about, the, the whole idea of Innocence Revolution is about taking this guilt and this shame and giving it back to the Lord and re, re-finding out who we are, rediscovering who we are as, as women, as men, as, as creations of God. So what happens when you've been sexually abused or when you've, when you've been raped? You know how we said, you know, sexual sin is so intense because it, it's everything. It involves every part of you. It's emotional. It's physical. It's spiritual. spiritual. It's mental. Your entire being <clears throat> is wounded when you're sexually abused. It affects trust issues. It affects intimacy issues. It affects safety issues. I mean, every... It is the most invasive thing that can happen to someone. It makes you feel so powerless. And again, then the shame comes in, and then the guilt comes in. And Satan does just this, such a deep job, <laughs> a thorough job, at telling you, you have now been broken. There is no going back from this. You cannot be unraped. You cannot be unsexually abused. This will be with you forever. Now you're going to have to tell your husband that you're dirty. Now you're going to have to tell your wife that you had this instance happen with a man. She's going to flip out, right? And so you keep it, you keep it, you keep it inside. And when you do that, when you take a lie and you keep it inside yourself and you shut out any truth that might come against that, you keep the lie inside and it doesn't stay small right? It grows until it becomes a perspective. When that lie becomes a perspective, everything that happens to you is filtered through that lie. So now everything that you are seeing and hearing is being filtered through this, I am trash. 
I am unworthy of being protected. I am unworthy of being loved. I am unworthy of purity. And so when you're reading the word of God and it's telling you these things like, I have a plan for you, it's not to harm you. You're thinking, did you notice when I was in fourth grade and this happened with an adult? Were you around? Like, do you see how this is? It doesn't make sense. Can you guys see how complicated this gets? The idea of innocence revolution is you were created <coughs> pure and innocent. I love the scripture in Philippians where Paul, Paul is talking to adults in Philippians, and he says, you can shine out pure and blameless like stars in the universe. He was talking to adults. That's not like children who haven't had a chance to mess up yet, you know? That's adults who have been through it. What God created you to be can never be destroyed by the devil. He cannot touch that. He cannot take you away from God. He cannot change your insides. You can choose to walk away from what God has called you to. You can choose to accept the lies that this has presented to you, that this has taught you. But the absolute truth is that inside you is what God created as pure and blameless and innocent. Now there are layers upon layers of experience, of wounds, of choices that you've made that cover that up, that gunk it up. And so when you look in the mirror, you see these choices, right? You see promiscuity, you see the abuse, you see boyfriends who maybe have told you, why can't you just lose weight? <laughs> Okay, you see the women who have never looked at you because you're not as buff as other guys or, side note, I don't even like muscles, so women are out there, okay? Don't worry about the muscles. Um, I don't know why I ended up with muscles. Okay. Once you get here. <laughs> you're hilarious. So, sorry. Um, it's there. All it takes is returning to that innocence, believing that it's still there. God hasn't changed it. It takes God to find it. For some of us, it has literally been decades since we've been abused. And every day for 20 years, you have been thinking, I am worthless. God doesn't care about me. Because if God cared about you, he would have protected you when you were weaponless right what kind of a god lets this happen to children who cannot defend themselves right did you know it's okay to ask him those questions don't ever let satan trick you into thinking you cannot be bare bones raw honest with god it does no good for you to keep the doubt inside for you to keep the questions, the anger, I'll tell you. And I'm not, I'm not saying this is for everybody, but the first time I really expressed my feelings to God, I cussed him out <laughs> because I was ticked. I, I had no other way of expressing it but to say, what is your deal? There are women who go their whole lives without being raped. It's happened to me twice. Could you not spread it out? <laughs> Okay, that sounds awful on the outside, but I'll tell you, I didn't care. <laughs> when I was asking those questions, I'd rather have it happen to someone else. It was awful. It's awful if you have ever been through this. It, I cannot think of anything worse. I had to get that honest with God. Because only God can answer questions that you have about this. He is the only one who can answer these questions. I will tell you, he has done such a work in me about why bad things happen in this world. I really cannot imagine something that would happen to me that would make me question God's goodness. I really can't. I, I have thought about what if God took my husband? I would know God is good. I'm not claiming I would be sane <laughs> for, a, for a period of time. <laughs> it would go out the window. But I would not desert God. 
because he's been the only one to stick with me this entire time and answer the tough questions. I have asked him, where were you? Restoration takes facing what is going on inside you. You cannot just move past this. Some people, I mean, it amazed me that um, I just spoke with someone who was telling me she was abused when she was a child. She told no one until she was 30, and it was as easy as telling her husband she was over it. That was it. That's amazing. I, you know, hallelujah. <laughs> For some, it's going to take you years. For some, you won't be able to fully tell your story for years because it is painful. But you keep taking those steps forward. Does that make sense? I had to ask God, why me? Why me? Why don't you love me enough to protect me the way you have protected other people? And in one of the most powerful encounters I've ever had with the Lord, he took me back to, the, to a moment. Um, it was a year after I had gotten saved, and I was raped by a friend of my brother's at a party. That was the one where I didn't think it was rape because I had had a drink of beer that night. So I didn't tell anyone for several years. Well, until Adam. So six years later, five or six years later. And he took me back to that moment, and I was watching it happen. And I saw Jesus in the corner, weeping, weeping. And I asked him, are you crying for me? And he said, I am crying that my son is hurting my daughter. I am crying because my son is this broken. It was both of us. I got caught in the crosshairs of sin and addiction, lack of control. I don't know what's going on in that guy's life. But I know that Jesus was weeping for both of us. From that moment, I have never, ever been angry at the things that have happened to me. That might not be your story. God might need to tell you in a different way, but that is how I got freed from that. But it started with a session in my car, out in the driveway, saying, how dare you protect other women and not me? And then writing your Bible that you love us all. You liar. Not the most respectful way to talk to the Lord. And did he address that with me? Yes, later. Uh, <laughs> It was the only way I could get it out, okay? And one of the giants of faith that I know, Steve Brannon, always said, if God's shoulders are big enough for you to cry on, his chest is big enough for you to beat on. Don't try and clean this up. It is a nasty, gross, sinful thing that happens, not because you are nasty and gross, but because the act is rape is mean. <laughs> Sexual abuse is mean, you guys. It just is. We have got to get honest about the way that we feel about it, the way that it affected us. It starts with God. I know that the first thing you want to do is blame him because couldn't he have stopped it? Yes. But he loves us and gives us free will. If I have the free will to choose good, that guy had the free will to choose bad. But what God did not do is leave me on my own to deal with this. Never, ever, ever. I know, I know it in my gut. That is why I will never leave the Lord. Ever. If he can bring me out of this, and I cannot tell you how much ministry it does to me <laughs> to be able to pray with women last night who are coming up and telling me, I have never told anyone this. They are the bravest, most courageous women I have ever prayed with. Do you know that you ministered to me last night? You have already begun to minister in your brokenness. 
Thank God for you. Being bold. Telling your story will minister to others. Now, you don't put this on a billboard, okay? It is a sensitive subject. Not because, I mean, yes, because it's offensive and it makes people uncomfortable, but also you want to protect yourself in how you're telling, okay? You don't want to become numb to this. You follow the Holy Spirit and how he leads you to deal with this. It will be different. Not all of you will tell your campus pastors. Some of you will go and tell a best friend. Some of you might be able to tell your parents. My parents don't know anything about the stuff that's happened to me. Not even when I was a kid. They, they don't know anything. And they love to listen to my preaching, and I told them, if they put this on the Internet, you cannot listen to this talk. It would break my parents. And they're not Christian, but I mean, they would feel so much guilt. And that's not why we tell people. We don't tell people so we look brave. And we don't tell people so that they can see what we've been through, right? This is what makes me strong. Absolutely not. That broke me into a mess, a suicidal, depressed, almost anorexic mess. Telling the right people made me ready for healing. And that's what made me strong. Not what I went through, but what God brought me out of. Do you guys see the difference in that? These are not bragging rights. These are bragging rights. Does that make sense? <coughs> God restores. I love, I loved when, when Dr. Bradford last night talked about um, restoring virginity. virginity. And I don't know why we are so permissive of people giving away their virginity and, and they're forgiven and yes, they are virgins again, but if you've been raped or sexually abused, you're dirty forever. And, and I hope you guys who, who feel that on the inside hear how ridiculous it sounds on the outside. It sounds way different when you say it out loud. You are not meant for brokenness. You are not meant to carry this forever. It is not a scar that you bear. It is a banner that you carry of God's providence, of his rescue, of his care, of how he has been with you even when it was the most painful for you, <coughs> ready to take over. Does that make sense? That's God, not a big, mean bully. He is the restorer. He is the rescuer. That's our God. Restoration is so important because, I mean, it affects my marriage. I have to work with Jesus for my own healing for my marriage. Does that make sense? I didn't know all this stuff until I got married, okay? I told, like I told you guys yesterday, I was 26 before I even realized I had been sexually abused or raped. Holy cow. <laughs> it, it's baby steps. I'm not asking you guys to leave here like, I'm free. You can. <laughs> I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm not saying you can't take even the smallest step towards that, but remember yesterday we talked about don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle. I would hesitate to say that I am even in the middle of what's going on. And I have had counselors tell me I've never seen someone go so quickly through this process. I believe that is Jesus because I believe he's sending me back to pits to help bring people out. So it's moving very quickly for me because I'm stubborn. And <laughs> I <was> Amen. It's a loving human. Right. So, okay. I need someone to read out loud to me Romans 12, 1 and 2. <coughs> uh, yeah. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice 
the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That was a perfect translation. Thank you. Thank you for volunteering, too. Um, can you read the can you change your mind part or change your mind? Okay. Whatever part it said. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Yes, you can stop there. By changing the way you think. Okay, here is, for as far as I'm in this process, one of the most important things about the restoration of this, okay? You have thought processes going on that you don't even know you have. You have beliefs that you do not know are important to you, you will find out when you get married, you didn't realize it was so important that the toilet seat was down until the toilet seat is up. And I don't know if you've ever sat on <laughs> a not down toilet seat, but I have fallen in before and it is not fun. <laughs> and it was like, I went from like sleepy bliss to like rage. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I did not know this was a value I held. Um, you just, you have no idea. Adam, I can't tell you how many times Adam has corrected the way I fold his socks. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> cool. If you don't roll the socks right, then the band at the top starts getting all, yeah. it gets all wrinkly. And then it, like, because it stretches out, and then the socks aren't any good anymore. <laughs> I'm not saying I was right. You see, you need to be transformed. Well, if only my father could hear me talk now. <laughs> we pick up beliefs from things that happen to us, from our environment. Remember we were talking about when you hold your like the oud, um, things are affecting your, your, your sex life now that you might not realize are forming your thoughts of what sex should be or what marriage should be from what you're watching or what you're listening to. Our experiences do the same things. We have got to get at the root of what's going on before our actions will change. Our thought life has to change. Remember yesterday I shared like I could just not stop, I could not stop making out with guys. <laughs> as hard as I tried, it was like I could see it coming a mile away and it just, I'm going to do this I guess. Okay, here we go, let's do this again. Even though this is going to stink, even though I'm going to get in trouble, even though this is gonna be the worst day of my life and I'm gonna probably lie to my campus pastor, right? I'm going to do this anyway because I don't know what else to do. I developed this pattern of behavior in college where when I found out that I shouldn't be, you know, like, okay, some of you will be able to re relate with this a lot of, and this is, this is textbook, but a lot of the ways that, that women and men react to being sexually abused or raped is promiscuity. There's count, there's, there's psychology in that. I don't want to get into it right now, but it's, it's just a way that we react. It's a way that we deal. Every, any, everybody ever heard the word coping mechanism? <laughs> yes, they're my favorite. That's one of the ways that we cope. Okay, you know what? If this happened to me and I couldn't control it, I'm going to control it from here on out. If you're going to take what I have anyway, I'm going to give it so it can't be taken. On the outside, it sounds like madness. On the inside, it's absolutely rational. This is why we've got to change our core thoughts. I struggled with um, cutting. It's how I dealt with a lot of things that happened to me in, in high school. It wasn't just <coughs> my whole life, okay? I'll write a book someday. It was insane. When I was confronted about cutting and I was told, you can't cut anymore. But this is how I was coping, right? So the inner thought that was, that was causing the cutting wasn't changed. And so what did I do? I stopped cutting, but I stopped eating as well. And I picked up an eating disorder because, okay, if I cannot deal with this by hurting myself, I'll just not eat today. And that is, that is how I will control what's going on in my life. On the outside, absolute lunacy. On the inside, completely makes sense. Can I yeah. I... <coughs> So the whole cutting thing, I, I'm, I, and I'll be really honest with you guys, I was guilty of being one of those people that was like, hey, you just have to stop this. You can't do this. 
Adam would say, is this really helping? Do you feel like this is helping? Yeah, which is really <laughs> stupid because when I tell my story, you'll see that I, I went through the same stuff. And then I, this is how dumb we are though. Like, we really are this dumb. Like we go through something that's very similar, even though the, the thing that caused the problem is completely different. We go through a similar process and then we're like, if only people would have treated me this way and this way, and then somebody else has a totally different thing, and we're like, why can't you just fix this? Just stop that behavior. Okay, she stopped the behavior, number one, and so, but we didn't get the root, and so she moved to behavior number two. Okay, then she was obedient, stopped that behavior, but we didn't get the root, and so behavior number three came up. Do you guys see that? <laughs> Telling someone, is it right to say cutting is, is a bad thing and you need to stop? Yes, that's a right thought. But if somebody who's been through sexual abuse is cutting and you want to, what is the goal? What is the real end goal? If you're trying to minister to someone, it's not to stop behaviors. Some of you guys need to chew on that. I had to chew on that. I still chew on that. Just my background, my character, my personality. Some of you guys are like laughing, okay? If you know me, that's fine. The goal can't be to stop behaviors. It has to be freedom and, re and restoration with Jesus. Trying to help somebody who's been through sexual abuse get to Jesus by correcting behaviors is like putting a target over there and aiming this way and shooting and saying, why didn't the bullet hit the target? Bullet, you just need to hit the target. It must be the gun. Gun, just stop being, you know, junk. You see what I'm saying? You can't aim at this when you're trying to hit this and then get mad at the instrumentation or the tool when it doesn't work. That was a lesson I had to learn the hard way. Go ahead. Love you. Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you, there were some fun days that we had while we were <laughs> starting out in the tree. Well, yeah. you said you're stubborn, and if you're stubborn, then uh, there's not even a word to describe what. <laughs> <laughs> so, so long story short, so it goes from cutting to an eating disorder till I found out that was bad, and so then I stopped the eating disorder, and what did I do? I picked up another coping mechanism. <laughs> Because you have to cope, right? <coughs> you seriously have to cope. There has to be an outlet. Now the secret to all of this is not a secret at all, but that it is Jesus who does this. Jesus isn't even a coping me mechanism. He can take it all away. Amen. This is not something that I wake up in the morning and I have to say, okay, I have to remember that I was sexually abused, but I'm going to react the right way to that today. I don't think about it unless I have to teach about it. Does that make sense? There are behaviors in me that have completely ceased. I cannot tell you how awesome it is to eat three meals a day. It is the best ever. If you've never tried it, please try it. <laughs> okay? It is awesome that now that I'm angry, when I'm angry, I don't have to cut myself and think there is no other way out of this. There is no other way to deal with the emotions I can talk to Jesus and just tell him I feel like what's happening is extremely unfair Lord <laughs> we'll deal with it Bethany <laughs> so, <laughs> we have to learn how to know why we do the things we do if you're if you're catching these words like cutting promiscuity Se uh, eating disorder, or there's, a, I mean, there's a list of things that people turn to. It could be Facebook, I'm not joking. It could, it could be internet activity. Are you trying to fix something? It can only be Jesus. And like we said at the beginning of this, that starts with you being honest, not only about what happened to you, but about how it affected you and how you feel now. Not to mention how you feel about the Lord. Because if you're angry with him, that's something that's got to be worked out. And I don't say that to be callous, like, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get right with God. But I'm telling you, as someone who was very, very, very angry with God, <laughs> cussing mad at God, he takes it, he listens, he speaks back. You pray until you have an answer. He has got the answer. It tells us in 1 Corinthians, he reveals mysteries to us that the prophets sought after 
and didn't get to hear, we do. And he'll say it the way that you need to say it. <laughs> if this is something that you've gone through, it's got to be dealt with. It could be like that. It could take some time. But find someone that you trust and tell them. Or Facebook me. <laughs> Unless you're addicted to Facebook, in which case maybe text me. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Well. You guys are all good. Do you need a shake? Like. Does everybody need like 30 seconds? Does anyone need to run to the bathroom? Yeah, kind of a chocolate shake. <laughs> a chocolate oh, shake? Sorry. She's got jokes in the front. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are missing out. Okay, so I know that's heavy, but you got to talk about it sometime, you know? We talked about, I gave you guys some stats yesterday. I'm going to run through some of these. Oh, good. I have a really quick addition to that. This is one of the smartest, smartest, most life-changing things I ever heard in counseling. She said, you cannot judge your fourth grade self with your 30-year-old mind. Okay? You guys can, with all your college learning and your TV and your Discovery Channel, look wow. back. Yeah. That was something. <laughs> look back at your eight-year-old self and say, you could have stopped that. Why didn't you tell someone, eight-year-old self? But if you picture an eight-year-old, or however old you were when this happened, would you look at them and say, why didn't you do a better job here, third grader? <laughs> hey, fourth grader who's been taught to trust adults, why didn't you tell an adult on this adult? You see how, uh, when it's someone else, we have grace. When it's us, we condemn. You did not have a 30-year-old brain when you were eight. You can't judge yourself by those standards. Okay? Awesome. Thanks again. <laughs> so, I gave you guys some stats yesterday. I'm gonna give you guys, I'm gonna go over some of them again. Um, <laughs> Here's a really cool thing that's happened at this conference. Like, half of what, maybe three-fourths of what I want to talk to you guys about, I've already heard other people say in other <laughs> talks, okay? Why is that cool? Oh, great, we get to sit here and listen to it again. No, have you guys ever heard that, was it? <coughs> when, in the, in the old days, when they wanted to emphasize something in their writing, what did they do? Does anybody know? They said it again, right? And then if they really wanted to emphasize it, what would they do? Then they would say it again. Here's a cool thing that God's doing at this conference. He said it, and then, and then he had somebody else say it. And then he had somebody else say it. And then another person said it. I was at, Heather's, Heather Erickson did a talk on the science and spirit of pornography. We have some of the same stuff. Three of the talks that have been, all three of the talks at the main session have had stuff that I had in my talk. I'm, this is not me like, hey, I'm really smart. Look at me, though. Compared, I'm up on that level. No, I, that's not what I'm saying. God's doing something. God's, he's, he's saying something that we need to hear. And here's the really cool thing, because I, I'm of the mindset, yes, we are very smart, but we, have, we really have dumb tendencies. <laughs> right? What's that line in, in Men in Black? A person is smart, but people are dumb, panicky, stupid, and you know it. Yeah. Like, we're smart, but we really are dumb, too. And... It, it, God in his grace, is, he does these really cool things where he's like, I'm going to say this really important thing. Are you ready? Okay. And then he says it. And then he goes, okay, just in case you didn't hear me, I want you to hear it again. And he's not being like that parent that's like, did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? Hey, did you, did you get your clothes? Did you, did you put your clothes in the laundry? You all had, did you guys have that parent? My mom, that was my mom. Like, my mom could ask the same question a hundred different times in a five minute span, and it would be a different question every time. So even if I said, mom, you already asked me that, no, that's not what I asked you. And then I, and then I got a lecture about talking back. <laughs> Delete that out when you put that on my own. So I don't get yelled at again. <laughs> I hope you guys are, God is trying to communicate. 
Why does it not speak to us anymore? <laughs> Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Okay, some stats. 56% of divorce cases in this country involve one, sp one spouse being obsessed with porn. The porn industry, just this past year, some of you guys are like business majors or you're gonna be in business. Some of you guys, you don't really have a concept of big number money yet. I didn't when I was your age, but I do now because of my job. In one year, the porn industry just in this country generated 13 billion with a B dollars. Somebody's watching it. That's one of my, man, there's a, there's a guy on ESPN radio, and I'm not going down that road, but I listen to ESPN radio a lot, and um, you know, he talk, he's just very real. He's not a Christian, I'm not saying go subscribe to his life policies or anything like that, life philosophies, but sometimes he's just, he's, he's super real. And I was listening to him one day and he said, you know, um, everybody in this country says, I don't watch porn. We don't watch porn. We don't watch porn. But the industry just made $13 billion last year. And over half of the people that are involved in porn, if you look at the stats, they start with the free stuff. Somebody's watching. And I'm telling you right now, the church is not, not those people. It should be. 2.24 billion searches for pornography since the start of 2013. So that is literally like one year ago. 2.24 billion searches. One in five mobile phone searches are for porn. You guys heard me talk about how technology is, it's just, it's insane where we're going. We're gonna have a watch phone and like yesterday. <laughs> like, right, Santa was on the commercial and he was like, can a phone answer, or can a watch answer a phone? And then he's like, it can. <laughs> and all the elves were like, <laughs> That was my Andy Erickson impression just there. <laughs> uh, Technology is insane. It is not going to be, if, if Jesus doesn't come back, it's not going to be that long until, like, the virtual reality from sci-fi is, like, a real thing. You know, where you're going to, like, put on a pair of, a hat or a pair of sunglasses and you're going to be like, feeling the sense that that's not that far away. Okay? Yeah, yeah, they're already trying to work on it. They're trying to, Amazon.com is trying to deliver packages with RC drones. I knew you were going to find a way to work that in. Somehow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm totally a sci-fi tech nerd. I'm not a Trekkie with like everything else sci-fi. I, I do like the new ones. <laughs> what is my point about Techno technology is not going away it's getting more okay and this stuff it, it, the devil is like all the devil loves that technology is advancing I'm not saying I did not just say technology is the devil okay but the devil is, the devil's crafty and he's trying to use everything he can to come at us okay so just be aware technology is a great thing but man does it you got to be careful with it one in five mobile phone searches were for porn 50% of Christian men and 20% of Christian women say they are addicted to porn. And I want you guys to have this in mind too. When you hear stats like this, probably numbers are higher. Because how many people don't admit to stuff that they think is bad? Right? Even anonymously. Nine out of ten boys, and say guys, boys were exposed to porn before the age of 18. Six out of ten girls were exposed to porn before the age of 18. Guys, you are over 500% more likely to look at pornography. This is a both issue, but guys, you need to understand that this is the devil coming for us. Now, women, he's trying to find a way to get you on this too because he's figured out how effective it is. But men, you gotta understand, well, that's not, it doesn't affect me. He's shooting for you. Maybe he hasn't hit you yet. And if it's not affecting you, praise God but if you look around you, the guys that are standing next to you, they're getting hit. 30% of 17 year olds have received a sex message. This is technology. Two years ago, that, te that, that term didn't even exist. And now, they're like trying to figure out, do they, do they prosecute children as adults for child pornography when they send each other naked pictures of each other? And this is not like, people like going out looking for this or putting themselves in this position like I got a really yeah <laughs> uh what, what's the word inappropriate offensive message from someone on quiz up I was playing a random game of, it's trivia I'm obsessed but uh 
It was disgusting. Mm -hmm. And it was just a random person that messaged me. Yeah, it probably wasn't an adult. <laughs> but you guys know that's the truth. Most of the people that are saying that kind of stuff, they're not they're not 30 year olds. There's a few, unfortunately. It's mostly not even the 20 year olds. That kind of stuff is coming from the, the, the 15 year olds and the 13 year olds. Eight out of ten boys and almost six out of ten girls have seen group sex online. Seven out of ten boys and almost 6 out of 10 girls have seen same-sex intercourse online. Pornography is devastating. And if you think it's not, then you need... We're going to have grace on you up until right now. It's time to open your eyes and realize that this is a real thing. <laughs> I really want to focus on getting free today. You guys have heard some of the, the biological... Heather, Heather did a great job. If you guys didn't hear it, go find it whenever they post the things on the scientific side. And there are tons of resources on just a quick thing, just so you guys know, like if you, if you look at porn for a long enough time, and by long enough I don't mean like 25 years, I mean like it's not that long of a time, your brain actually physically starts to reroute the pathways that your thoughts go through. I don't know if you guys know that, but like if a thought is a car, it drives on a highway in your brain. And when, when you look at porn long enough, those highways, your brain actually starts to reconstruct where the highways go to filter your thoughts. Because your brain starts to get addicted to the chemical stuff that happens, and it wants it. And, and actually, I heard a stat a couple of years ago that the chemical processes that take place in your brain, in the brain of a porn addict, are actually 10 times more addictive than that of what happens to a, a cocaine user. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but even, like, I don't know how substantiated that is. I don't know how you measure that stuff. I, I, the brain is like, I don't even want to go there. It's so complicated. <laughs> But there are people out there that are doing these studies, and it's, it's even to think that it's in the arena of the level of addiction of cocaine. That should open your eyes. This is not a joke. Proverbs, here's the cool thing about scripture. God knew this stuff a long time before we did. He knows this stuff, and he's known it since before we were even created. Proverbs 27, how old is Proverbs? We read that and we're like, there is nothing for today in there. This is like, uh, this is like, my, my grandpa would read this and think it was old. <laughs> Proverbs 27, 20. Just as death and destruction are never satisfied, the eyes of man are never satisfied. When your brain starts going through those processes, it literally, it reroutes it to, to, to train you to go for the quicker payoff. Because your brain wants to get to the payoff, the chemical reaction or whatever, quicker. And so it, it trains you to do it more and more often and quicker. Does that make sense? Because your brain wants that payoff, and then it wants it again, and then it wants it again. Literally, God is telling, this is not like some, like, this is not Eastern philosophy, oh, the eyes of man are never satisfied. No, <laughs> God made your brain, and he knows how it works, and he's trying to give you wisdom. Mm -hmm. Tell him you should play with fire, you're going to get burned. Yeah. This is what he's trying to tell us. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a scripture that says, do not join yourself to a prostitute. A lot of us in here are probably like, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right? I really want to be, really be careful how I say this. I want to be sensitive. <clears throat> but at the same time, I want to be very real. What is a prostitute? Okay. What happens in pornography? Okay. Now I am not. I'm not going down that road. I'm not labeling because because it's it's staggering what has happened to the women that are in pornography. And this is not a talk of it's women's fault. It is so far from that. This is a man. You got to get control. You got to get. The, you got to get with Jesus and get this under control. This is this talk. Okay. <clears throat> but you need to understand that there's a biblical principle that's playing out even in pornography. We talked about. It's been talked about a lot this weekend. Sex causes people to become one, okay? Mm -hmm. That's a physical bonding, but there's spiritual, there's mental, there's emotional. And I can tell you right now, as somebody who has walked through this, that process is explicitly talked about with the sexual union. That's not the only place where those bonds start, okay? Some of you guys are gonna get uncomfortable with what I'm about to say, okay? But <clears throat> I know from my past 
there have been videos that I have watched that were really hard to let go of and forget, okay? I never met this woman. I don't even know her real name. I've never talked to her. She might live on the other side of the world. But there is a bonding process that starts mentally, emotionally, and I believe if you, I, I think spiritually it can even start to go that route. And you guys heard a story the other, the other night about somebody was experiencing demon oppression in their life because of somebody in their past that they still had, they didn't have anything to do with now. How is that even possible unless there is some sort of bond that is created and hasn't been cut wow. so that there's a pathway for the devil to still come through? Yeah. <coughs> do you guys get that? Yeah. Sex is, is a, it, there is a bonding that happens. And if you think that doesn't happen, then open your eyes. And if you think that pornography, well, that's not sex. Okay, you didn't have it physically. But where was, your, where was your mind, where was your heart, where was your spirit? We are not just physical beings. We have got, we have got to realize that. And this is not to mention all of the horrible atrocities that this thing does to women. <clears throat> so, again, I said I, I really kind of want to talk about getting free. This is not an exclusive list of how to get free. This isn't like Adam's five-step program, <laughs> especially because it's, I think, actually six. <laughs> <laughs> These are things that I've learned through walking in the mud. A lot of this has come from men way wiser than me who have walked with the Lord and gotten out of stuff, and thank God for them. If you guys weren't here for the first day, this was, I was in this stuff. I was having sex with women, I was addicted to pornography. And here's the thing. A lot, of, a lot of people, I was talking to a guy just yesterday after my talk, and I said, I don't come into a talk like this and say, I was a porn addict. Because instantly, excuse me, like half of the people in the room are like, well, that's not me, so I don't have to listen. <laughs> yeah, the problem is we don't understand, we're just now starting to understand how addictive this stuff is and how it messes with your brain. Most people who have a, a porn, I, I struggle with porn a little bit. Yeah, you probably have a little bit of an addiction, and it's probably a little bit in the early stages, and you probably a little bit need to deal with it now before it gets bad. I listened to a story, <clears throat> God, praise God for this guy. I listened to a story, um, I think it was at Forward, and a guy who, this is their ministry, is to, is to help people get sexually restored. And he came in and he talked. And he told us a story about his, his life started with just a little bit of pornography. And when he was in the depths, he was, I think he was a pastor. Even if he wasn't, he was, he was in the church and he was, you know, he was somebody in the church. He was a leader. He was leading a Bible study. He was the same stuff that you guys are trying to do with your life, okay? And it started early in his life with a little bit of pornography. And this stuff doesn't stay little. That's a biblical concept. All of this stuff is, it's amazing. God is so smart. If we would just listen. <laughs> At his lowest depth, <clears throat> he was watching pornography regularly. He was, fine, he was, he was in, having extramarital <coughs> affairs. He was, when he couldn't satisfy through pornography or through extramarital affairs, he was hooking up with prostitutes. And he said in his worst moment, there was a day <clears throat> where, it wasn't a day, it was at night. <clears throat> He drove down where he knew the prostitutes would be, and he, he picked up a prostitute, got back to a hotel, hotel room, found out it was a man. And he said, and I couldn't stop myself. This is not a man who's ever struggled with homosexual tendencies in his whole life. He's in his 30s, I think, at this point. Couldn't stop himself. The devil's not playing around, you know? And I sat there that day, and, and you know, I, this wasn't when I was in the throes of it. This is when I was well on the road to recovery, and, and I, you know, I've seen a lot of success in my life. And, but I was sitting there, and I thought, my first thought was, ooh. Not gross, he's gross, but just, ooh. That, ooh, man, that is, you are in deep. And then I thought, God, how, how far would I, was I really from something like that? 
And I didn't feel like the Lord said, well, you were just three times away. No. <laughs> but I, I, this, this gravity hit me of like, this guy was me. He was me. He was you. Wow. It was a little bit of pornography. Yeah. It was recreational. It wasn't hurting anybody. Mm -hmm. How do you think his wife felt? Mm -hmm. How about all those people he was minister ministering to or trying to minister to? I'm not here to tell you that sin is like it removes the hand of God from your life completely and you're done. Because I've seen too much in my life to, to know that that's not, that's not how God works. Amen. He is graceful. <clears throat> but do you think that guy was ministering at 100% capacity? <laughs> do you think he was ministering at 10%? <laughs> and we wonder why the church isn't being effective in this country. <laughs> you know? I'm not saying this is the only thing, but... Okay, some keys to getting free. One, you got to be sick of sin. you got to. And if you're not, if you're sitting here, and I've been in this position and I've prayed this prayer, if you're sitting here and you're like, I really want to be sick of sin, but something in me is like, I still want this thing, you got to start asking God, make me sick of it. Do it right now. And he'll do it. Don't expect it to be fun. <laughs> but he'll do it. <clears throat> do I? <clears throat> Oh, there's a lot of stories. We're oh. talking about it. Oh, I don't know. We'll see. Hey, nobody's gonna get. You, nobody's gonna pull you out of this stuff. I, I had a girl come up to me yesterday, and she said, "You know, my friend is in this stuff, and she. I know God is in her life, and I know He loves her, and I. I love her, but it really stinks to watch her going through this. What can I do? Pray for her. And don't ever think that's that's just that's our like last resort. Oh, you can pray for her. Have a nice day. Hopefully she'll get better. Blessed and highly favored. Okay. If you take prayer seriously, prayer is war. Okay? Prayer is war. And I cannot wait to get to heaven and meet the people that were praying for me. I'm telling you what. But as good and as powerful as prayer is, God's not going to override free will. And if you are not going to choose to get out of this thing, he's a gentleman. He's not going to, he's not going to force you. Some of you guys just need to hear that truth. God's a gentleman. He's not going to force you. He will let you choose all the way to hell. He will weep and break the whole way. And he will be standing there with his hand out saying, if you'll just take my hand. But he's not going to force you. You have got to get sick of sin. Some of you, that means you just need to have a revelation for the first time of what it really is. I remember, I can remember benchmarks in my walk with the Lord where he dropped, I call them revelation bombs. And I'm not talking like the fun, like, oh, God just gave me revelation about my fear. I'm talking like, he dropped a bomb on me, and I, I felt like what, internally, this is what it had to be like in Japan after they dropped an A-bomb. I mean, I was wrecked. I was done. Nothing's growing in that area for 50 years, you know? Unless the healer comes in. Because that, when you have a revelation of the glory of God and the disgustingness of your sin right next to each other, it'll, it'll wreck you. And if you haven't had it, you need it. I don't wish bad things on people. And I'm not, like, I, I used to be, like, I used to love that. Like, oh, I'm just, my ministry's going to be being the hammer. Let me tell you, being the hammer's not. <clears throat> that is part of my ministry. And, I, and I, I'm appreciative of it because I've had hammers in my life. It is not the most fun ministry to be the hammer. It doesn't make you popular. No. <laughs> it's They're just not. They're not the ones who get pastor appreciation cards. No. <laughs> and if you, you need to appreciate the hammers in your life. This is just a side note. Because the person that comes to punch you in the face, they really want to be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's improper. Right? Yeah. yeah. It really is. If, I'm telling you, the, the God is so smart. <laughs> what does he say? An, an enemy multiplies kisses, but wounds from a friend you can trust. But, uh, but a friend who punches you in the face, you can trust. <laughs> That's modern speaking. <laughs> what was I talking about? <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. Um, you have got to get a revelation. I heard this old school fire preacher preaching one day. I was listening to revival sermon, revivalsermons.com or .net or something. 
Be careful with that stuff. <laughs> it's good, you need to hear it, but don't just go for like a month period where that's all you listen to every day because you'll wake up after a month and go, I don't know if I've ever been saved <laughs> or if I've ever done anything right. I'll tell you that from experience. <laughs> Probably have. Um, but if you have not had, and if you haven't had a recent revelation of that and you're struggling, you need to get in front of God and ask him to wreck you. Second thing is your motivation has to be the right motivation. I'm not saying, God, you know, I read a teaching where it said your motivation has to be X or God's not going to, you can't expect God to help you. I'm not saying that, okay, because God is gracious and he's merciful and he'll teach us along the way. But I'm telling you right now, if your motivation is not God, his glory, and a relationship with him, nothing else is good enough to break this stuff. You have to be rooted in an infinite source. Because if your thing is, I want to be a good husband, I'm telling you right now, there are going to be days where your wife is going to do something, you're like, I don't feel like being a good husband anymore. <laughs> At least not for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes is plenty of time to do something stupid. <laughs> I want to be a good leader. Okay, what about the times when everybody that you're leading and praying for and you're fasting for and you're sacrificing getting to watch the Bengals game, and you're, you're, giving up, you're giving up Xbox time, or I don't get to go do me time. Whatever me time is for you. If you're going to lead people, you got, you be ready to start giving it up. Not all the time, but be ready to start giving it up. That's one of the hardest struggles in my life. I want my time, or whatever it is. I want to go be on my drum set. Don't talk to me. There are going to be days when the people that you're leading are going to do things. Yeah, I lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> They're going to do things, and you're going to be like, you little punk. You little jerk. Do you know what people are doing for you right now? Do you understand the sacrifices people are making for you, and this is how you're acting? You're an idiot. And you, I'm telling you, because we're human. And you're going to be like, I, I don't care about ministering to you today. If your motivation is, I want to be a good minister, a good leader, it's not good enough. The Bible says the righteousness of man is as filthy rags at the feet of Jesus. You guys know what he meant when he said filthy rags? What did he mean? Somebody said it. Menstrual rags. He meant menstrual rags. What is that in modern day English? Tampons. Dirty oh. tampons. <laughs> the best things of men, the best thoughts, the best motivation, the best ideas that we can come up with are like filthy, dirty tampons at his feet. Wow. <laughs> Should we yell at the word tampon? Tampon. <laughs> Do you guys get that? Your motivation can't be anything but God because anything else falls short of his glory. And you need God's glory to come in to break this stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is not just pornography. This is habitual sin. Yeah. You heard Linda talking about it in a whole different context earlier today. They're the same principles for getting out of sin. Your motivation has got to be God's glory and your love for him and his love for you. It can't just be your love for him because that's going to fail too. Because you're the source of that. It's got to be God, his glory, his love for you, and you want to love him back. It's got to be a combination of that stuff. It can't be, I want to be good anything. I want to be a good Christian. I want to be a pure man. That's not good enough. What about, the, what about when you don't feel like being pure? It's got to be about God. He will always deserve glory. And he will never stop loving you. Those are infinite sources. Those have got to be where you're rooted and anchored. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Corinthians says, Whether you eat or drink, do all things to the glory of God. Third, and this is... I agree with Linda when she said this is the hardest step. I'm sorry, number four is the hardest step. But it's like three and three A. Number three is you gotta confess to God. You have got to get in, you gotta get on your knees in front of God and you gotta confess. And none of this half confession of I probably shouldn't have done that, but no, you gotta get in front of me and you gotta say, I'm an idiot. This was this was dumb, and I am sorry. Oh Lord, I repent and confess my sins. No, get specific. I watched a stupid video. And I'm sorry, because you're better than that. 
you got to you got to go through a process what a lot of people call radical amputation. When you confess in front of God, okay, Bethany, I I love that quote. You stole some of my thunder. I love Steve Brand. I'll credit Steve Brand all day for this quote. God's shoulders are big enough to cry on, but most of us don't understand that his chest is big enough to beat on. Okay, I'm not advocating that like every quiet time and the bulk of our life is just spent like cussing God out. Okay, I'm not advocating that. But how many of you guys know that like we get that we get those times where there's like a little ball of rage monster inside of us and it's kicking and screaming and cussing and clawing and it is ugly. And what do we usually do with that? Ooh, push that back down. That's bad. Christians don't act that way. And we think it we think because it didn't come out of my mouth, I'm doing right. Right? Self-control is a good thing. Practice it. But I'm telling you that pushing this thing down, pushing that beach ball down, that's not dealing. That's not getting it out. That's not dealing with it. Bethany talked about the same thing. Some of the most powerful quiet times that I've ever had were six minutes, seven minutes of me screaming and pounding on my steering wheel in my car. Okay? But here's what I did beforehand. Not the first time, but I figured this out over time. God, I need to confess. I'm sorry for what's about to come out, but it's already inside of me and you can already see it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not fooling you by pushing it back down. The word says everything is naked and exposed before him. Think about that. He already sees it. So what good is it doing to push it back under the rug? He can see under the rug. You're not hiding it from anybody, at least not anybody that matters. You gotta get it out there <laughs> you gotta, you gotta vomit it up. You gotta get it out of you, and then you gotta put it in front of the Lord, and you gotta say, "Okay, I repent that that was even in there." Now you tell me what to do with it, and then you gotta shut up and listen, and then you gotta go do what He tells you to do. Okay, for pornography, that's gonna involve radical amputation. If your left eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Okay. I don't tell you this as somebody who's like, hey, that's a really good concept. I threw a computer out His when I was in college. Like My mom still <laughs> is mad about that to this day. I had a problem. And I was trying to get out of it. And I was trying to get free. And I wanted out. And I was sitting there one night after I had messed up. I looked at porn, I had masturbated, and I was sitting there and I was like, God, I, I don't, this is not what I want. How am I still here? And he said, are you willing to get radical? God said a lot of things to me. And I said, okay, yeah. Throw the computer away. Okay, yeah, tomorrow I can get up and I can, no, throw the computer away. Well, I got, you know, it's like three in the morning. I got, you had time to get up and do this, didn't you? Mm. Burn God. <laughs> <laughs> I grabbed a trash bag and this was like not in the days like right now we've got a little tablet throw it away okay <laughs> laptop fold it up two pound toss it this was like the tower was like you know, this big this guy. it was a flat screen monitor but it's still a monitor and a keyboard I had like six speakers in my room hooked up for surround sound I was like crying about losing the surround sound <laughs> oh, sacrifice for you guys <laughs> I walked out at 3 in the morning and walked to a dumpster that was right around the corner from my house and threw my computer away. I didn't stop to think about how am I going to get my schoolwork done, what about when I got to type up the paper, what about when I got to, because I had been playing that game. You ready to get radical? Yeah, but what about? You ready to get radical? But it's going to cost me this. You got to get sick of sin. God's going to give you the steps. He's going to tell you what to do. Are you going to listen? Are you going to do it? And then you got to do this other thing. You gotta get in prayer time and you gotta start cutting spiritual ties. And you gotta you, you can't stop until it's done. You gotta get in a prayer time and you gotta say, search me, oh God, and find any way that is in me that is offensive. Like they like he says in Psalms. And I'm telling you right now, our tendency, you start feeling that searchlight heading in a certain direction, you're like, okay, I prayed the prayer, I did it, that's what he said I had to do, it's good. I said, search me, oh God, and then he searched me, and then now we're done. It's good. Great. <laughs> See you next Tuesday. No. 
you gotta sit there and you gotta let him go through every part of you. You gotta let him comb through you. And when he shows you stuff, you gotta say, okay, what's next? Okay, and this is not easy. I'm not trying to tell you this is easy. But I'm telling you it's worth it. <clears throat> when he brings stuff up, whether it's a girl that you slept with or a guy that you made out with or a video that you watched or a story that you read that you cannot get out of your brain, you got to pray that stuff away. you got to, God, I cut ties with this in the name of Jesus. It has influence over my life no longer. I repent of watching it, of enjoying it, of being in the place where I was. I'm sorry that I was there, but I cut it in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood over that. And you get free of it. Go to war. You got to cut spiritual ties, emotional ties, mental ties. Relational ties, maybe. It might cost you a friend or two. You got to get sick of sin. You see why that's number one? When you start walking down this process, God's going to ask some things of you. If you're not sick of sin, you're going to turn back. Get sick of sin. Number four is the hardest one. For me, it was. And I think for a lot of people. you got to confess to other people. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I'm going to try and speed through these because these are good points, but I've been talking a lot. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of righteous men can accomplish much. There is a thing about sin, especially sexual sin, that it wants to stay in the darkness. It wants to stay in the shadows. And I think one of the biggest reasons is because the second that you shine light on it, it starts dying. Yes. Linda said something real similar. Every time that I've had to confess to somebody, I've walked in and the devil has heaped so much weight on me of they're going to kick you out of, the, out of the church. You're not going to be in leadership anymore. You're never going to be on a worship team again. You're never going to be able to do a Bible study again. You're never going to be able to make it into heaven. You can't, you can't have, you can't, you can't. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to. And I confess. And even the most hammer of hammers in my life have met me with grace, sympathy, not always empathy, because not everyone can empathize. Not everyone's been through this. But they have met me with grace, and they have met me with, okay, what are we going to do? How do we go forward with this? How do we get out of this? How do we not do this again? It's never been what I expected. The devil wants you to stay alone. <clears throat> There's that verse that says he seeks to... He, he, he stalks around like a lion. You guys ever, you guys ever watch any of those, those nature documentaries? How do lions hunt? You ever see a lion charge into a pack of 50 of anything? What about a pack of 10 of anything? They don't do it. They wait. They follow the herd. They'll follow herds for miles and days. <coughs> just be patient. Everything, and the herd knows. They're there. Now just keep their distance. Just waiting. Just running along. This pack of wildebeest just running, just jogging, and they're patient. The devil is patient. And it doesn't have to, well, he picks off the sickly ones. Not always. Sometimes he just goes after the one that's 10 feet behind. Someone that let their guard down. <clears throat> Someone that let their guard down. You can't beat this stuff on your own. You have got to get in a body, you've got to get in fellowship, you've got to get in accountability with other people. But first, you've got to confess it to other people <clears throat> so that they can pray for you and you can get healed. Number five, you've got to drink from living water. Okay, this, is, this is similar to number whatever, where you've got to be rooted in an infinite source. Okay? What does that look like? You need to read John 4, the woman at the well. She was... Drinking from broken cisterns. You guys have probably heard that. That's, that's kind of a cliche thing if you've been in the church long enough. <laughs> drinking from broken cisterns. I know, cisterns. it just sounded funny when you were like, been there long enough. Like, let's just throw it out. <laughs> Who yeah. listens to cisterns anyway? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not going to go, I could preach on that. That's a whole sermon. I could talk a whole sermon. I could talk a series on that and what that's meant in my life. You've got you to be, what is living water? 
Anybody? What's li- what, what is the living water? It's Jesus. How do you drink it? Take it in with the Bible. What else? I can't hear you guys. I'm a little bit deaf. I play drums, and so, like, I, you know, I don't know. What else? Prayer? Being in his presence. you got to get in his presence. You can't just read the Bible, okay? you got to read the Bible in his presence. You can't just go to a prayer time and pray for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Some of us can talk. You ever been in that prayer time? I'm that guy. <laughs> been in that prayer time? You got an hour prayer time and that one guy prays for 45 minutes of it? We can talk. I don't like Adam to pray before we eat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that guy sometimes. Some of us are that guy. You gotta, you gotta get in his presence. Prayer is a two-way thing. You gotta be in his presence. You can't just pray your laundry list and your Christmas list and your chore list and and give me more list list and I don't know. And then be done. You gotta be in his presence, and, so, and that means sitting and listening too. And that means responding. You gotta worship. You gotta get in worship. And again, that is not singing songs. More happens in 10 minutes of his presence than happens in X number of time not in his presence. That, how old was that woman? 30 years old when she finally talked that stuff out and she was healed like that. But for how many years did nothing happen to heal her of sexual abuse? We've got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to power the Holy Spirit to do that. We've got to read the Word. We've got to let the Holy Spirit minister it to us. That's another thing. God was so smart. You need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Literally, when you've been addicted to porn, your mind needs to be renewed. It needs to be fixed because physical things have happened. Sixth thing, you, you have to build walls up and get accountability. Okay? I have three, I think, smart devices, laptop, tablet, smartphone. Every single one of them has covenant eyes on it. I'm done. I'm done with it. Putting a wall up. I have 10 guys on my accountability list. Every website that I go to, 10 guys comb over with fine tooth comb. And I will get called out (laughs) if anything even smells of going down that road. And praise God for them. Some of us think accountability. I got to talk to my one buddy who struggled with this that one time too and, and ask him, maybe talk to me about it once in a while. I've got three pastors on my accountability list. You think I want to go up to a pastor after I've just watched, you know, whatever video and say, yeah, I did that. You're on my worship team. You're leading our youth. We're putting money into your ministry for... And I'm not saying that's how a pastor is going to respond. Because they're graceful. They're good, they're good men and women. But I hate being wrong. I hate messing up. And I, have to, I hate even more than that having to admit it. <laughs> I set up in my life walls that would put a weight on sin so heavy that I couldn't not think about it if I'm going to mess up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Set yourself, there's, a, there's a quote. And I don't know where I got this, self, got this from. But it says, do not lay provision for yourself. To fall back into your old ways. Do not set yourself up to fail. Set yourself up to succeed. Build walls around the things that you can't be a part of anymore. Mm -hmm. I cannot have electronic... And maybe God's healed me of this, but I don't care. I'm not going back. Because I'm not going back down. I'm not battling that stuff again. Mm -hmm. I hate that stuff. I don't want any part of it. And the devil knows that's a weakness of mine. And he still tries to poke at it. Mm You gotta get sick of sin and you gotta get in front of the Lord. And if you are out here and you're thinking, I have never been through any of this stuff, praise thank you for coming to this. Praise God that you came to this. Because, man, one, your testimony that it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> and praise God for that. Yeah. But two, you are in a unique position to minister to people without having to drag all the baggage in that you have. I just want to pray real quick. Is that okay? Is that okay with everyone? God, I thank you for this group of people. I thank you for this conference. I thank you for the speakers that are here. I thank you for the opportunity to share 
our stories in the places where we have been broken and you have come in and fixed us and made us strong. God, I just pray for freedom in this place in the name of Jesus. I pray for restoration in the name of Jesus. God, people who have been in these talks, people who haven't been in these talks, in the name of Jesus. God, let there be freedom and restoration. God, help us to be accountable, to be real, to be open and honest and raw. Help us to be trustworthy, to minister. When, once we're out of it, God, help us to be the kind of people that can minister to people who need to get out of it. In the name of Jesus. And I pray, God, more than, more than even all of that. God, I, just, I pray for a, a reversal of what the devil is doing in this country with sex. God, and for the glory of your name, for the, for the beauty of your bride, so that you would be pleased with her, with us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Um, this was long. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. You Thank you for listening. Thank you for those of you who have contacted and uh, talked with us. You... We love you. You know what I mean? There is a survey that you're supposed to be filling out. We don't have the address. There you go. It's on salttoday.org.